Welcome to the Farming on Purpose podcast, a podcast for farmers and ranchers ready to shift for a stronger future. Today's challenges in agriculture are new, but the grit and determination required to be successful are not. On the Farming on Purpose podcast, you'll hear how producers of all sizes and practices are moving mountains for things they believe in, all in the name of an industry that keeps growing and innovating for a stronger food system and stronger farm families. I'm your host, Lexi Wright, and I'm excited to discuss where producers are finding success, challenging the status quo, striving for better, and keeping our heritage alive, all while producing the food we depend on. Welcome back to Farming on Purpose. Today I have Ashley Westerhold with me and Ashley is the director of the Ag Transitions Office. They are part of K-State and resources that they provide are in kind of ag and farm transition planning as well as other mediation, financial planning services to farmers and ranchers. And so I'm really excited to have Ashley here today to chat about that topic with you. It's a commonly talked about topic on the podcast with folks. So Ashley is here with the resources that we are often looking for. So Ashley, do you want to tell us just a little bit more about yourself and how you came to this role um, and kind of more about what you do? Yeah, thank you, Lexi. So again, I'm Ashley Westerhold. I'm the director of the Office of Farm and Ranch Transition or Ag Transitions how I rebranded myself. I grew up actually in Northeast Georgia. So a little bit about me. I did not grow up on the farm. I had farms in my family. So my dad is from McCool Junction, Nebraska, and my mom's from Illinois. We still have a family farm in Northern Illinois that is operated by my aunt and uncle. They It's a typical farm, corn, soybeans of few head of cattle, but not anything too big. I went to school at University of Nebraska. I knew from when I was a little girl uh, that I was going to go to Nebraska. Even when I grew up in the heart of bulldog country, Nebraska was where I was going to go for college. So I went to school at Nebraska thinking I was going to work for John Deere, becoming an ag engineer. And I quickly found out that I love math, but I do not love physics. And so engineering kind of went out the window. But my first semester of college, I had the privilege of being in an AggieCon 101 class. So so teaching you introduction to ag economics. And it was taught by Ron Hansen. So Dr. Ron Hansen has been in succession planning and ag business planning since way before I was born. And he is still doing farm succession planning in his retirement. I took his 141 class and every class that he taught, he did one class that was geared towards how to return to the farm and kind of transition planning topics for the students that were in his class. And as soon as I heard him talk about the impact that he had on family farms and having people come back to family farms and preparing for that day, I knew I wanted to be Dr. Hansen. So that was my life goal was to be Dr. Ron Hansen when I was his age, working with farm families, how to pass on the farm to the next generation. And so that led me into graduate school. And then from graduate school, I took my first job, University of Idaho, where I was farm management based. And so I did a lot of farm financial management and I did succession planning for farmers at the University of Idaho. Once I was at University of Idaho, my boss let me actually have a lot of leeway in professional development. So I went to a lot of farm management business consultant conferences. So I worked with all of the farm succession consultants. I went to farm legacy conferences. I learned from other attorneys that were in the farm succession business. I worked with a lot of the universities that had a really good curriculum for farm succession planning. And so it really bloomed my interest. It really helped me get to where I am. Additionally, I took mediation training. And so I did a week-long mediation, ag mediation training so that I am an ag mediator. And so 
all of this, again, is trying to be put together so that I can be the best farm succession coordinator, facilitator that I can be. And that led me to Kansas State in 2020 uh, to take over the role of director of the Office of Farm and Ranch Transition. So, yeah, that's where I've been, how I got here. I continue to work with farm families every day. Tomorrow, I'm actually going to Sharon Springs, Kansas. So I hit all the corners of this state helping farm families through transition planning. And that could be for related parties or non-related parties. And so some of those resources, I don't know, Lexi, if you want to ask me about them, but I can dive into either side of what my office does. But really, we just tried to hit the gambit of how do we transition the farm from the current generation to a next generation? And what will that look like? How can we financially make it work for all parties? And so, yep, that's really my job today, but I'm happy to get into specifics. Yeah, it's a blessing to have you here in Kansas with such a breadth of skills that you bring to the farmers and ranchers here. Are these programs available in other states or most states with a land grant or how does that work? So really, it depends on how the land grant was formed, how they are funded. So a large succession planning school or people that have created a lot of resources are in the University of Wisconsin. And so I use a lot of their resources and Iowa State University. And so I would say the University of Wisconsin actually put in a lot of effort to build a succession planning kind of center and they've been able to do that. And so it's always interesting because Wisconsin, they're 100 cow dairies. And so we think, and they have about 300 acres, like that might be their average size um, where we're talking about Kansas, where we might have someone who has 10,000 acres. And so both states need transition help. It's just interesting that Wisconsin really dug in their heels and said, we're having succession planning here and we're offering that for our farmers and ranchers. And I think that we are following that where we are trying to dig our heels into understanding the importance of succession planning for our farmers and ranchers here in Kansas. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about some of the programs and the resources that you guys have available. And maybe is this like been an evolution of adding these things or have they been longstanding in the Ag Transitions office? Yeah. So as soon as I took this job, Robin Reed, who is with our Department of Ag Econ at Kansas State University, she is an extension associate. Her, Dr. Featherstone, who is our department head, and Kevin Herbal wrote a grant to get this office started. And the grant was to really highlight the opportunity of the land link program. And so the land link program is where we match beginning farmers and ranchers with farmers and ranchers who do not have that next generation coming in. And so a lot of the grant, what I am funded off of, is to manage and open that land link program for people across the state and for other people in other states to come to Kansas to farm and ranch. So that is a huge pillar of our Ag Transitions programming is hosting and being that land link manager. Another part of the grant that I was funded off of is the one-on-one consultations. And so that is really providing technical services to farmers and ranchers about the transition process, helping them get started in the transition process. And that includes a lot of goal setting, family conversations, understanding what their next steps are, how to get through this process. So we don't necessarily have to start at the attorney. What do we need to prepare before going to the attorney? And having a lot of the difficult conversations. And even in that one-on-one technical services, we work with our farm analysts. And so we do a farm analysis sometimes if we're like, how can we afford two families to be supported by this farm? Can we? Can we service our debt? So a lot of those questions come within our one-on-one technical services. And then the last part of our office that was kind of funded from the grant is that we are providing beginning farmer ranger trainings on Kansas State campus for Kansas State students. And 
Right now, that is our returning to the farm course that we provide in the spring. And so we ask juniors and seniors who are thinking about returning to the farm, we tell them to kind of take this class if that's something that they want to pursue after school is going back to the farm. And what we actually have them do is the potential business partner. So that could be mom and dad. That could be grandma and grandpa. That could be a cousin. Whoever their potential business partner is or who they're returning to the farm with has to sign off on allowing the student to take this class and has to sign off on giving them financial records. And a lot of the transition process actually begins on understanding the financial aspects of these operations, having an understanding and a grasp of the financials. And those are really what we're honing in on in this class is making sure that it can be financially sound, but then adding a business plan of saying, if you're going to return, then you need to add value to this operation. And how are you going to add value? And so an example would be, I'm going to start a small squares business, which could actually give me more than the large round bales. So small squares and I'm going to need a new baler, and I'm going to need to do this, and I have a new market that I need to market to. But the opportunity is there for me to add value by diversifying our business. And those are some of the things that we're doing in the returning to the farm course. But really, Landlink, one-on-one consultations in the beginning farmer rancher course are what is encompassed in Ag Transitions. And there's many things that have evolved inside of those three pillars, but we haven't really expanded outside of those three pillars yet. And so my dream is that our returning to the farm course becomes more extension based or is open to community colleges. And so trying to open up that class and the course and its content to people across the state who wouldn't necessarily come to Kansas State University. But that is my kind of five-year dream, and I'm trying to work towards that goal. That would be incredible to have that as a resource accessible for more students, especially who are maybe not pursuing secondary education. That's really neat. I want to dive a little bit more into each of those pillars. Let's start with the course. So a lot of students that are taking that as they are finding out the financial records of their family's operation, since that's a requirement that the parents sign off on that or the whoever signs off on that. Is that typically a surprise to them or is it something that a lot of them were already familiar with? How does that usually go? I would say it's a sliding scale of people who have seen the records or have kind of an understanding of where the farm is at to people who have been completely in the dark and they had no idea. Um, I think that's just parents in general, too, of how you handle the conversations around finances, how you talk to your uh, family members about finances. So it really just depends on parenting styles. I will say that our farms that had participated in this course, there wasn't necessarily any skeletons in the closet for any of our students. They just had never Some of them had never seen him before. It wasn't that it was concerning. I think the parents that signed off on allowing their kids to take this course were also understanding of transparency. And sometimes if there are skeletons in the closet, they're not going to be transparent. And so I would say all the people who were in our course, because their parents had to sign off on it, it wasn't like they were going to find a huge issue. I will say that understanding how parents do finances was also something that a lot of people were struggling with because it's not necessarily how structured we teach kind of financial analysis, how people do their balance sheets, how people do their income statements. If you only do a schedule F or you own, there's again, differences across the class of how people keep financial records. Some people's parents could tell you every penny that has gone out and it's in an Excel spreadsheet that they've had for many years. And some truly just gave the kids schedule Fs and that's their records 
And again, across the board. Yeah, it's interesting in farming, I think, that the we use the financial records as a tool for so much of what we do, but really to understand the true matter of the situation, you have to have that communication there. It can't be just the form to communicate all that's going on. Yeah, and some people are really good about writing things down maybe in a notebook. And once a student receives that notebook, it's, where does this belong? Where does this go? How is that notebook form or what's on the notebook that's that little like transaction that is written down? Where does that go when I'm trying to create a balance sheet in a form, a very structured form that we provided to the students? Where does that go? And how do we account for that? And then same thing, kind of another big thing is depreciation. So for taxes, depreciation usually happens a lot faster um, on the tax schedules and other things than it would just doing basic depreciation over time. And so how do we account for that? How do we look at that and make sure that we're understanding what has happened for tax reasons versus what we should be putting away to replace that combine over 10 years. So there's a lot of things that we learn with the students and they learn from their parents in that class. Yeah, I can see how just the better understanding of how to use those forms and what the different terms mean could be super helpful. Like I'm thinking back to the first time that we applied for farm loans. And I don't know what any of these things mean. (laughs) Like you have a general idea, but there's usually not very specific guidelines on the form of we're talking about 10 years or five years and those numbers change a lot. I can see how that alone would be helpful to a young person in just being able to apply for different funding. Yeah, actually a part of the class is an FS loan application that we have the students fill out. They have to come up with that business concept or what are they buying? And then they have to come up with their cash flow. They have to understand what their personal assets are. So they asked about your personal assets. So does my pickup go on there? Yes, that is a personal asset. And so we have those conversations with them, preparing them to go out, work for the three years or whatever the minimum is for FSA kind of application base, but preparing them to apply for an FSA beginning farmer rancher loan and give them the opportunity to do that, have a better understanding, have a more competitive application than if they did not take this course. Yeah. So that's a very valuable tool. What are some of the other topics or maybe things that you see most benefit the students who take that course? Yeah. So a lot of them sent the FSA beginning farmer rancher information. A lot of our course participants were really interested in insurance programs. And so understanding the FSA program payments, understanding PRF, so that's the pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance, understanding how other crop insurance programs work. And so we had a crop insurance agent actually come in and describe how they get premiums, what premiums do, what are the indemnities, So payments that you receive, how are those calculated when you have a loss? I think a lot of students were interested in that piece. Additionally, we had other topics like how to value land. So what is the value of this land? How do you find resources to help you with valuation of land? We also talked about many other topics, green, livestock marketing. We talked about Oh, gosh, there's so many. Basic record keeping, tax planning, human resource conversations. So that would include like how if I turn 26 and I'm off my parents' plan, how is the farm going to support health insurance for me or is it not going to? Other conversations include, I'm trying to think of all the class topics that we have. It's a pretty wide breadth of just like touching on all the things you might need. And then I assume they have that should provide some awareness to them of, oh, I didn't know anything about that. I need to learn more and opportunities to do that. 
Yeah, I think one of the parents' comments, so we actually bring the parents in for a parents' weekend during this course or the business partners as we frame them. So the business partners have to commit also to coming to campus one weekend of the semester. And one of the parents really wrote in their evaluation back to us was that it was good to have an understanding that we want those parents to enter into a testing period with their students. So we describe that the parents shouldn't just jump into partnership with these students right after school. They don't know if it's going to work out as these children transition into adulthood and actually becoming business partners. And it's not that you have to commit to them right when they come back from school. And so we describe that in our family weekend of saying there should be a testing period. And then from this testing period, we need to start putting timetables on when they will get to start making management decisions and what will they get to have management decisions on. Are there classes that they should have taken at K-State that could actually better help them be the green marketing person? And so what are their skills? What are they coming back? What are they bringing? And then how are we going to give them opportunities to move into that managerial and do that over time? And so we want people to start this transition process at 55 and retire at 70. So a 15-year, very general rollout is much easier to handle than at 70 telling me you, you want to retire in five years. And it's a very different situation. But what we're trying to tell the parents is that just because a student is coming back doesn't mean you need to give them ownership right away. It doesn't mean that they should have full management control over the 5,000 acres or the 1,000 acres or 500 acres, but that they need to have some ties to showing where they're going to be promoted, essentially. So I think of it as like a 10-year process in academia. After six years, you apply to get tenure. You could go up early if you're doing very well, but really it's around five to six years. And I would say that should be kind of similar for a lot of jobs is that big jump of tenure is showing commitment, showing that you're here, putting in the work. And maybe after that six years or five to six years, you have fully committed to this place and you need to start having managerial options. And where are you going to fit in that? How do income streams change? Are you going to income share, profit share, maybe work from a salary employee or a wage employee into a net profit sharing employee? So we have those conversations and parents are like, oh, taking a deep breath because they think when we talk to the students about returning to the farm, that we're saying they need to give up the whole farm as soon as the student comes back. And that is far from what we talk about with the students. I, I don't think anyone should leave their farm to a 22-year-old right now. That testing period is very important. I love how it formalizes the process because I think that the lack of just structure around it, the emotions, obviously, if you're dealing with family and then just not knowing what to expect is what creates so many of the issues in farm transitions. Having this structure laid out and here's an idea of how it could go and here are some suggestions of how you can make it remove some of the questions of when things are going to happen makes so much sense. And is I feel like setting up these kids for a much better opportunity than they would have if they just showed back up and were like, Mom, Dad, I'm back. Here we go. But yeah. Okay. That's the course. Lots of really great information going out to those young producers there. With the Landlink program, let's dive into that next. Landlink is, I'm just going to give a little more context for folks, the pot potential opportunity for a producer or a young person, farmer or rancher of any kind, really, to try to apply to access land that or a operation that a retiring producer is wanting to transition to someone and doesn't have someone to transition it to. So both the landowner and the potential producer apply and then go through a matching process that you guys facilitate. 
tell us a little bit more about how that's been going, how long it's been going on, where kind of where it's at. Yeah, so I think that the whole premise of the land link, like you said, is land access. So we're trying to give beginning farmer ranchers land access opportunities without them having to come up with $3 million to just have some land to operate to support their family or to support their dreams. And so we have this retiring generation that a lot of them don't have children coming back or not interested or interested in a different part of their operation. So another avenue of this is they might have someone coming back, but someone's going to have to replace that role. For example, there's a farm family in in this area. Their son has been heavily on the crop side, has been back doing the crop side, but dad has always been managing the cattle herd and it's enough to support the two families, but someone's going to have to replace dad. And so someone needs to help with the cattle herd, take it over as their own, work together as a team. But there's opportunities there for someone to work every day and be around cattle and support their family that way. And so that's another part of our land link, too. So it doesn't have to be all aspects of the farm or ranch that might be available, but maybe just some. And one of the things that our land link started in July of 2022. That's when I started taking applications. The application system is fully online and it is you self-identify, you apply yourself. Some of our landowners don't feel comfortable with uh, the online system. So sometimes I am there filling out the application with them at their house or in the farm or on the farm with them. But really, it's a 12-page application for both the land seeker and the land owner. Currently, we have over 130 land seekers and we have 22 land owners. How's that process going? We've had three landowners match. The three landowners that matched, all three of them, yes, we're in our land link system, but all three of them actually used our land link tools and found kids in their community to join the land link to then meet with them and join their operation. And so we still count them as matches because they went through our land link system. They filled out the application. They were kind of coached into how to promote the opportunity that they were trying to supply a younger farmer or rancher, but they weren't necessarily very warm. They met organically outside of the land link before kind of using the land link system. Um, The land link system is a great idea. It's just very hard to get matches just because you're an older farmer or rancher. And usually that's what our land owners, their demographics are over 70 and they have very large operations and they have very high expectations of a young person or a young family coming in. And it's very hard to match those high expectations with what the younger generation is actually able to provide. And so it's been a little bit of a sticky point for the land link. I'm still hopeful that we'll have more matches and that people are more interested and we get more landowners. It's just that sometimes these processes take longer than I think people were expecting when having a land link. And again, we have to try to manage the expectations from the landowner and try to make land seekers really aware of the opportunities and make sure those match. And so it's a work in progress, I would say. And I will say the Kansas land link is not alone in some of the issues. So I have colleagues at Nebraska Land Link. They see similar issues, Iowa, similar issues. It's just hard when someone's worked on their farm their whole entire life and grew this to a $5 million asset-based business. And they have children of their own most of the time. And now they want to give it away. And I would even say it is giving away most of the time, but it's just very hard concept, especially when they don't know you. Like I said, our three matches have been more organic in relationships or previous people that have been in their life 
that they were able to present the opportunity to. So I guess that's where we are with our land link. Right now, I actually have an intern that we are going through all the land link applications. We are trying to have send out to you all of our land seekers to update their applications to make sure that we have an understanding of what they're truly looking for. And then we are going to send out to all of our land seekers the same opportunities or the opportunities that we have left with some of the landowners that have entered into our system to see who wants to apply for those. So we're going to open up the process a little more. Again, the landowners will be completely unknown, but we are going to give more specifics to the land seekers. So we have a person who has a feedlot and has 1,500 acres, and they're around this general area. Are you interested in applying for this opportunity? And that way, I'm not just sending them applications of land seekers who turn down the opportunity as soon as they call them which has just happened. We had a landowner who's in Cloud County. They called 12 of our land seekers who I thought were interested in that area of the state. 10 of them said, I'm not interested anymore. And that looks bad on our land link program. That looks bad on me. Um, And so we're trying to dive through, regroup, make it a better system and hopefully have a better understanding of how this can work better in the future. So we're kind of in that process of regrouping, restructuring and understanding better ways to approach the land link program. Yeah. Well, I just want to say kudos on it being a tool that people can use at all, because the fact that it exists for people to have the opportunity to connect with some of these landowners as a beginning and farmer and rancher. Like there's just not other opportunities like that. If you don't have one of those organic connections, like you mentioned with somebody, then there's not a lot of opportunities to go just seek out people that might have these opportunities. So the fact that it exists at all is a win in your hat, I think. And then, um, yeah, you're trying to do such a complicated matching process of Things that change quickly over time, matching expectations, matching locations. It's that's yeah, it's understandable. That is challenging to do, I think. You mentioned that having the expectations on the landowner's part is challenging because they've grown it their whole life and they are trying to find someone that they feel comfortable and can trust. Is there anything, any advice you would give to land seekers? who are trying to prepare for an opportunity like that, that they can do to try to increase that trustworthiness or skill level factor from the landowner? I think that a lot of landowners really want someone who's willing to learn and being very open and wanting to learn, being inquisitive, being curious. If you grew up on a farm, your whole life and you're one of our land seekers then maybe you already know how to work the sprayer or the combine or working with equipment or understand the basics of operating a farm but our land owners have treated their farm maybe differently than what you grew up with grew up in and so having that really curious nature of asking them why they do something, how they do it, why does it matter to them? And having that constantly with them will go a very long way. Um, so I would rather you play down your knowledge and expertise to try and be interested in how they have done it. So the way that you grew up doing it might not be the way they like to do things. And understanding that and coming from a place of curiosity, I think will go a long way. And I know the generation of my landowners, they are very interested, again, in being a mentor. And the reason that they're in this program is mostly to be that mentor to someone. And so you just saying, I want to rent your acres and just take over your acres is not going to go well with the current landowners that we have. And so really being open to have that mentor-mentee relationship. Does your business accept online payments, credit cards, or bank transfers? You're going to want to know about a tool called ThriveCart. 
I've been using this tool on my own website and on clients' websites for years and have been so happy with it. Thrivecart is a software tool you can use to design online checkouts with every option you can dream up. You can sell physical and digital products, connect to loads of other softwares you use for your website, accept payments, email marketing, and more. This is the most powerful tool that I use and the lowest cost one for my business. I recommend it for anyone who accepts online payments, who wants to increase their revenue or average order value on any type of product that you sell. In my show notes, you can find an affiliate link that I have for Thrivecart that gets you a great deal on a one-time payment, no subscription, and also allows me to earn affiliate income from this tool that I really enjoy and recommend. If you have any questions about how Thrivecart could work for your business, feel free to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Now, back to the show. And so valuable as a young producer to have that asset of someone who can show you that instead of just dumping it in your lap and saying good luck. (laughs) So I guess take away from that, I would encourage anyone who is a potential land seeker to apply for the program if you're in Kansas or seek out a potential other program if you're in another state, because it does take a big pool of applicants to find that match. I mean, if you're talking about 20 to 25 landowners and 120 land seekers, that means one in five would have to be a match. And that would be a pretty high statistic to be able to find and make those things jive just perfectly to create a match. So a bigger pool of land seekers can only mean that there's more potential for matches. So if you guys are considering it, I would encourage you to go apply. Yeah. And again, some of those organic relationships, people don't know that there's land seekers in their backyard. So sometimes I'm like, hey, this person is looking for land and they're, they, that actually happened with our Cloud County producer is they knew this kid and I say kid, he is 40 years old, but they knew him and they knew his dad and they were actually friends with their dad and said, I didn't know they were a land seeker in my area. I didn't know they were interested in taking on more acres or working with someone. And really the land link can be there for those relationships as well and help those blossom. Really apply to be a land seeker, apply to be a landowner. I think that, again, the tools that we provided to the landowners about dishing out what these opportunities are, what those expectations are, were very helpful in having the landowners who matched identify what that was for their next generation on the farm or their successor. And so having those tools were really helpful to them. Absolutely. Very valuable tool. Let's dive into kind of the last pillar of the program, the consultations. Um, Tell us a little bit more about how people go about signing up for those, what they can expect in that process, and how you guys determine if someone's ready to do that. Yeah, I would say readiness is them actually making the first phone call. So the first step is calling me or emailing me or going onto our website and doing a consultation where you set the actual time for an initial phone call. And so any of those ways of getting in contact with me really shows your readiness and your commitment to this process. So I only get so many calls a year. I work with about 60 families in a year, and those 60 families have called me for a reason. They've taken that first step. They have shown they're ready for this process or they're in need for this process. And so that really, again, shows me that they're committed to doing this by just making that initial phone call. From the initial phone call, I get an understanding of what's going on in the operation, who's involved, who's not involved. What are the current issues that have stopped succession planning before? So if I get a call from an 84-year-old, I'm like, why are you calling me at 84 and not at 64? And so what has happened throughout this process? What has stopped you from transitioning? Or what opportunities are you looking forward to by transitioning? So are you trying to retire? Are you trying to go visit grandchildren more? What are you trying to accomplish by doing this? And so really we dive into those kind of questions if we can during that initial consultation. Usually from the initial consultation, we schedule subsequent meetings, and that could be 
first meeting with the owner generation. And that could be matriarch, patriarch. That could be whoever the owner generation would consider themselves to be. And, and so I set that meeting. We go into, again, goal setting. What are we trying to accomplish here? And then where's the financial situation of the farm to help understand what it looks like, what the financial picture is. I think a large part of transition planning or lack of transition planning has to do with the financial aspects of the operation. And is the operation financially stable, financially stable enough to support a next generation having that farm business? And as a farm business consultant, as an ag economist, that is a part of my job that I think is crucial in transition planning is understanding, is this operation able to support a next generation? Is this operation able to support even the current generation? And so is it a viable business that we should be talking about transition planning or we should be talking about other ways to get out of debt and how to manage our current situation? And so really that financial aspect, I try to get that out within the first meeting. And that leads us into our next path of if you don't have the financials or a good grasp on the financials, then we hook you up with a farm financial analyst. And they go through creating balance sheets for you, income statements, cash flows. And then they have a long-term planning component to this farm analysis that's able to show you, can I pay off debt in five years? What will I need to do? And they set different market prices just based on cycles. They're very conservative, but that kind of helps gear us in the right direction. Again, if we're bringing someone back and we need another $100,000 to support a family coming back, can the operation support that? And these are things that we like to look into before we dive into going to the attorney's office, before we talk about transitioning farm equipment to the next generation, before we talk about income sharing. All these things really are based on the fact of the financial analysis of the operation. Then we dive into family conversations. So once we have the farm financial analysis done and we're saying, OK, this is a viable business. We will have to make ideas on how to add another family member or if there is already a family member there and it's successful and it's supporting both of them. How do we transition to the next generation? Do we have off-farm accounts? Do we have ways of supporting retirement? How is the labor going to change? How are management decisions going to change? How are payments going to change or salaries or income based on these transitions? And so that's really the on-farm heirs with the owner generation. And then we bring in off-farm heirs. So another part of this is the off-farm heirs. What, letting them understand what is happening, how the transition is going, the succession transition. And then we can talk about estate planning down the road. But really, when I meet with families, we're talking usually about succession, which is supposed to happen hopefully when you're alive. And so how to transition the business from one generation to the next. Estate planning is just transferring assets from one generation to the next. And so we talk about what's good for the business and then what's good for the family, the heirs later in life. And so it's a long process. And usually in there, there's conversations with accountants. And so I go in with farm families and meet with their accountants. There's conversations with attorneys. I go in with these farm families to meet with attorneys. And so trying to push you along through this process or lead you through this process so that you continue your momentum. Whatever had you motivated to call me that first day, I want to continue moving on that and keep you guys through this process. It's really comforting to understand what that process looks like, I think, from someone who would be potentially looking at succession planning with help. I think a lot of people either put it off or don't tackle it and don't tackle it or they try to tackle it themselves and get really overwhelmed with the process because it's a lot. You mentioned that a lot of times when people call you, there's like a reason why they're calling you. 
What is the most common reason that is pushing people to take that step? Unfortunately, most reason is because they're 84 or in their 80s and they truly feel like they should start something now. And so age is probably one of the biggest reasons. Or they're having back surgery because they're 85 and have been an owner operator. And so there's kind of health reasons. So like just aging reasons. Um, Additionally, I've had calls lately and I understand that we're in a financial situation and the farm economy right now is not great. And so there's a lot of financial concerns with transition planning. And so we're bringing someone back or we brought someone back in this year. We're carrying over an operating note because we weren't able to support the farm or our family living expenses. How are we going to move forward? Should the younger generation be buying me out at the same time that we're in this kind of downturn in the farm economy? And so we have a lot of financial struggles right now. And on top of transitioning, which is never easy or something that we like addressing, but that's when we really use the farm analysis aspect of what we do to help the families understand, is this just the cyclical nature of the farm? Are we going to have to weather this right now? And can we weather it and get out onto the other side? Is there enough time in the day for that next generation to have an off-farm job to help support them in these down years? Or again, add value somewhere to where they can start making money that doesn't necessarily have to tie directly with grain markets or whatever is happening. So a lot of the calls are financial concerns. And then I'd say the last calls that I have been lately are maybe from the younger generation saying I'm 45 and there has been no transition planning that has happened or no transfer of management. And I am getting very tired. And I now have a 18-year-old who wants to come back and work after they're done with high school or whatever that looks like. And I don't know if I could put my next generation into the same situation that I've been in, where I'm just a hired hand and have been. And so those are kind of the three that I've had lately. One is I'm aging or I have health concerns. And so this is an immediate need that we need to do something. Second would be we have financial concerns of supporting two families currently. How are we supposed to transition when we currently have financial concerns. And then the third is from that younger generation saying, the needle hasn't moved in 15 years and I need something to change. And how can we convince mom and dad to start transitioning and allowing that to happen? So those are kind of the the things that I've been seeing. Heavy stuff. I'm sure that those calls are often eye-opening. When people are in those positions of thinking they're ready to start succession planning, it seems like it's maybe something that should have been addressed a lot sooner. Is there an ideal time to start planning succession planning? A lot of the transition planning cases that go the most smoothly is when someone starts at 55 or earlier and is fully bought out of their operation, is fully supported by the time they're 70, that at 70, they can be that hired hand. They can be the gopher, and they don't have living debt over their head. They don't have day-to-day decisions. Or I I think that them being out of the green marketing game at 70 is good for their mental health. And the idea that they had 15 years to kind of go through the waves of a downturn in the farm economy is probably going to happen in that 15 years. An upturn will happen during those 15 years. I mean, they were able to weather different things in that 15 years. They were able to get bought out of certain things. So tax implication wise, more time to transition allows you more time to make better decisions, give you more opportunities. 
life insurance policies at 55 versus trying to get one at 70. I mean, there are so, so many tools that you can use, but when time is on your side, you can use those tools well, and you're able to do something over a very long period of time versus a young person trying to buy you out of $2 million worth of equipment in five years is not necessarily realistic. And so giving yourself a lot of time. And I would say starting at 55, if you have that goal, that's great. I know some people who are starting at 35. And again, they want to be retired early or they want to do something. I think that's generational differences to a little bit of, I don't want to work until I die. If you can start earlier about talking about transition, being open about the finances at the farm, being open about what is happening, how are we making decisions, including the next generation in that makes them a better owner operator later in life, makes them understand things better. And hopefully they have a grasp on what the operation looks like, how it's able to move through these different cycles. Again, I just give yourself more time than you think it takes and be open to starting that process early and starting those conversations early. Absolutely. And that doesn't mean that they are stepping away from the farm or turning over ownership at 55. It's that's when we're starting the process. Is that what you think holds a lot of people up is they think if I start sooner, it's going to be taken away from me or I'm not going to be involved anymore? Yeah. Like I said, when we had the returning to the farm course and we brought all these business partners, mostly parents in, they thought, oh, returning to the farm means that we have to give them the farm when they come back. Absolutely not. But having the conversations of what are things that you can be bought out of Having a tax understanding of being bought out of equipment, how am I going to spread that tax implication over a certain amount of years? How are we going to handle different profit sharing? Are we going to do that? Are we able to support them wage-wise? Do we want them to expand into renting acres? What does that do for our amount of workload for either of us if we ask them to go get more rented acres outside of the farm? Are they able to have time to work on all of the operation. Having those conversations shouldn't be happening when someone's 70 and their child is 50 or 45. And these are things like at 55, maybe your kid is 30 and we're talking about, okay, are you going to return or not? I also have 70 year olds that are thinking, oh, my child might come back after they retire at 55. And I was like, can you hold on for 10 more years? Realistically, the way you're going, can you hold on for 10 more years for them to retire at John Deere or at Syngenta or wherever they are and have a retirement package to help support them start farming at 55? So again, starting the transition process of 55 doesn't mean you're going to keel over at 55 because you have nothing to do. No, we're just talking about are there ways to start incorporating that next generation into you? So that means that if the combine breaks down in year four of a 15-year process, should that young kid be the one buying the new combine? So you don't have a note to worry about at 70 that you are scared of retiring because you have notes that are hanging over your head and causing you stress. And you're saying you can't service those loans without operating. And so those things can be fixed. So you're out of debt at age 70. You own all the land. Tax strategies with basis and other conversations, we usually see the older generation maintaining land ownership until their death, which is fine. And that's a way of retirement income is renting out your acres to the next generation. So it's just, again, having more time to deal with this process. Having more time for fights to happen and it not be the end of the operation. Having more time to come up with different funding sources, loans. Also, the saddest thing is when mom and dad haven't allowed the opportunity to buy things and you've missed your FSA beginning farm or rancher loan window because you've been on the farm for 10 years, you have 10 years of the schedule F, whatever it might be, 
So your 10-year window of applying for a beginning farmer rancher loan has closed and you weren't t- able to use it. And again, that happening at age 45, I mean, it's just starting this process as early as possible is going to yield the best results. And if that result is me and my kid can't work together, the farm life is not for them, that's better for you to find out again at 55 than it is at 75. So these are reasons I say just start as early as you can, as early as you want to, and starting looks different for everyone. So starting is just a basic business planning. Where is our business today? How are we going to manage our business How do we start treating it like a business so that this can be easy to transfer to someone when someone's interested in coming back? Yeah, I think we covered the three pillars really well there. The last thing that I wanted to touch on is just the incredible number of stories that you are getting the opportunity to hear from these Kansas farmers and ranchers. What have been some of the most impactful that you're like, wow, I'm going to remember that forever or that was really rewarding? There are easy ones and there are long ones. I feel like I've been talking a lot, but some of the ones that I have just been blown away with is parents' recognition of some of the state planning documents that were not necessarily thought through and changes are made. And those changes just provide a deep sigh of that next generation. So there's a family out by in Min, Kansas, that I worked with. And dad and mom were extremely smart. They had a lot of off-farm accounts. They had IRAs. They had retirement accounts. I think mom worked for a financial planner in town or something. So they had just as much in cash assets as they did in farm assets. And still, they put in their estate planning documents undivided interest of everything. They had an on-farm child who has been on farm for 30 plus years, and they have an off-farm child that is a nurse in town. And the nurse in town said, what am I going to do with the farm? And the on-farm child was like, I want the farm. I've been operating the farm. I have my next generation coming back. And just telling dad, hey, you can switch this to where farm assets all go to him, the off-farm assets all go to the daughter, who's the nurse. And really, I don't know how it wasn't so black and white to them, but really it equaled out the exact same. And what we just did was save a farm. I mean, that farm could have been sold to get the undivided interest out. There would have to be an understanding of how to buy out that half interest. And now it's just clean. And I got an email from daughter-in-law who is married to the on-farm heir that said, I can sleep so much better at night. And I will keep that email forever. But that was such an easy fix, in my opinion. Just you go to the lawyer's office and you get your trust amended. You say all these assets go to so-and-so and all these assets go to so-and-so. Once someone passes away, once that person passes away. Those assets go to them. Those assets go to them. They don't have to make a decision together ever. I mean, truly, they never have to have a conversation about who gets what, where does this go? Then it's all decided. And it was all agreed upon. So we brought in the off-farm We brought in the on-farm They agreed. Dad rewrote his trust or amended his trust, and they are sleeping better at night. And those simple things are some of the things that I'm like, that was a huge win. And it shouldn't be because it was, in my opinion, very common sense. But it was great to have those emails saying, thank you. Helped us so much. Even when I get off farm airs saying, thank you for having mom and dad start discussing this. We haven't heard about this. We've been curious about this for 15 years. We were wondering when you were going to call us or we were hoping someday you're going to call us to tell us what's happening because we have no idea. And I think that's a large win, too, is even when off farm airs, so people who are not involved in the day to day are thanking me for helping mom and dad work through this process. 
And I think that's some of the coolest things that come from this job too, is people you don't expect thanking you. Yeah. So very rewarding and opening those communication channels, I think is sometimes the hardest part amongst family to even remove that emotional lens that makes us not see, oh, it would be so much simpler and make so much more sense this way. But we didn't see that because we were too busy worried about the relational issue of it. So it's incredible to have that resource in you and in the Ag Transitions office. So if folks want to learn more, work with you, where can they go? Where can they find you and follow up? Yeah. So if you are interested in contacting me, you could go to our website, which is adcansitions.org. That is A-G-K-A-N-S-I-T-I-O-N-S.org. Or you can call me 785-532-4526. Or you can email me. And that is adcansitions at ksu.edu. A-G-K-A-N-S-I-T-I-O-N-S at ksu.edu. So all three ways will come to me and get to me at some point. So perfect. And if I'll give one last plug here, if you are in Kansas, there are some great conferences coming up that Ashley will be at and that discuss exactly this issue. Very eye opening, great opportunities to learn more. So you can check those out soon on the website as well for where those will be and dates for this coming year. So thank you so much for being here, Ashley. Thank you. If you've enjoyed spending time with us today, please take a moment to review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or join the conversation on social media. Do you have a topic you would like to discuss or know someone with a story to share? Apply to be a guest on the podcast at farmingonpurpose.com. You can follow the host of Farming on Purpose, Lexi, on your favorite social media platforms for more content by searching for Farming on Purpose. And remember, if you look around your table and aren't inspired by the people there, it's time to find a new seat. 